Ladies and gentlemen, it is really a personal honor to welcome two of the very, very best here in New Bedford. Two people who have preserved New Bedford and South Coast history with a passion that is uh, without measure. We have Joe Thomas, the publisher of the Spinner Publications, along with Jay Avila, the associate publisher. To both of you, welcome back. It's long over. It's been a while, yeah. Thanks for having us back. Put that mic right there in front of you, and uh, good, morning. good morning. We have uh, some fabulous news. Well, the book is uh, getting close to completion. What book are you referring uh, this to? This is uh, The History of New Bedford, Volume 2. Volume 2. Volume 2. And in what years does this one cover, John? Uh, that covers where we left off on Volume 1, which is 1925, mm -hmm. and it takes us to 1980. Mm -hmm. Now, originally, we had planned to bring it to the present, yeah. uh, but we changed those plans, so we're going to do three volumes instead, because there was uh, just so much material. Sure. We, we have a book now that's about 360 pages. It's growing. It's still not, not finished yet, so... Uh, to bring it up to, to 2015 would have been about a 600-page book. So. Wow. So we're looking at um, cutting this off in 1980 and picking up again as soon as this is out. Okay. When is it coming out? <clears throat> this is coming out late November. Okay. And we're uh, pretty much on schedule for, all for, right. for a change. <laughs> a picture History of New Bedford, Volume 2, folks. I know many of you have Volume 1. If you don't, go out and get that one then add to it volume two, 1925 to 20... Uh, 1980. 1980. Let me, let me make a correction here. 1980. <laughs> <laughs> it changes so many times. <laughs> it does change. <laughs> All right. So what uh, can we talk about the picture history of New Bedford with the second edition now? Well, one of the things uh, we'd like to mention is that uh, we're still in the process of uh, a fundraising, uh, what they call a crowdfunding yeah. campaign, which is uh, being conducted through Kickstarter and through our website. Yes. Uh, we're trying to, to raise the money that we need to go to print, which is uh, quite a bit of money, but uh, we're doing well with it. We have a nice campaign going. Where do we uh, find the campaign? Well, through our website, spinnerpub.com. Okay, spinnerpub.com. Uh, or if you're familiar with Kickstarter, yeah, uh, you can go right to Kickstarter and look up Spinner Publications. And for folks who can't do either, can they send in a check directly? Yeah, we have. We've been using the regular mail for. Uh, we've sent out several hundred uh, mailings, and obviously you can't get everybody. But um, you know, if, if people want to call us or if they email us, or uh, we'll send them out uh, some mail with all the information, and we can use the mail or the telephone. Yeah. So uh, we need more money to uh, keep Spinner's mission, and that is to record and uh, preserve uh, our people of the, our culture, our story of the South Coast, and also something that uh, perhaps you'll be interested in, folks. The second edition is going to show you in pictures and uh, in words the impact that events have had here on the South Coast. The yeah. depression. Right. And uh, hurricanes. What else? You know, there's so much, Phil. Uh, oh. and there's, there's so many people lost in history. There's so many events that had such a great impact on the community. I think understanding, you know, history, the historical context of, of, of life, mm -hmm. is, goes a lot toward how we feel about our community and how we feel about where we are in time. I think history is very important, and, and a lot of us who, uh, you know, argue about some of the things that you're hearing on the air and about issues, uh, sometimes it's good to, to step back and look at the community and see how we can do things on a local level to change uh, the things that are larger in life. I think, yeah, I mean, it goes back to Tip O'Neill's, you know, all politics is local kind, yes, of, kind of, of course. philosophy. Absolutely. That until you can affect, impact, or change what's happening within your own little bubble. I mean, it's good to be involved in national and international politics, but you're not going to change a whole lot. Uh, you know, I hate to sound like, yeah, we don't have a uh, vote doesn't matter. Yes, it does. But we have more power and influence if we can work. 
uh, within our communities. Yes, yes. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, this book, ladies and gentlemen, is documenting the history of our community. We were just talking about homelessness. I wonder what homelessness was like back in, you know, the Depression or thereafter. Yeah. Here in New Bedford, I'm talking about. I don't know. Yeah, we're really get into that. I know. Uh, well, uh, no, 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 but you know, New Bedford had a lot of uh, homes and shelters and a lot of uh, support organizations, and we've covered a lot of that. Yeah. You know, I, well, I was uh, working on this. Well, yeah, this day we were doing the uh, day nurseries, yeah, the, day uh, nurseries. Uh, the West End Day Nursery and the New Bedford Day Nursery. Oh, yeah. Two of them uh, were very active during uh, the Depression, the war years, and later, and even today. In fact, the West End Day Nursery uh, was highly regarded in its time when it was founded in 1941, uh, 42, because people, New Bedford had such a high uh, number of women in the workplace more so proportionally than almost any place in the country. I think Philadelphia was maybe the high of those. New Bedford was like second in the country in terms of the percentage of women in the in the workplace. And that increased during World War II because we had so much manufacturing, yes. war-related manufacturing. Right. And because there had been a history here, going back to the textile uh, era of the 19th century even, of women working. And so, uh, when they introduced uh, day nurseries, yeah. at first, though people you know weren't didn't take to it, and sure. it was, and they had to uh, advertise, promote the idea of mothers bringing their children under someone else's care for the day, and uh, it took a while, and then uh, Elnora Williams in the West End, when she uh, got her program going with a lot of help, community you know, infrastructural support. Uh, more kids came, more and more families in, in the West End uh, got involved, and that sort of trickled outside the area, and, it, and both inside and outside, because people came from other parts of the city, but also the other nurseries began to expand. Right. The government uh, gave more money, federal money, through the school system, and uh, they had lunch programs and the milk, uh, you know, and all the things they're working, and it's, you know, there's nothing new today, well, there is things new, but a lot of things that we have that we are so controversial have been going on for a hundred years and have been controversial for a hundred years. <laughs> you, say, <laughs> you know, there's so much uh, like this. So we, we're constantly studying this stuff, uh, Phil, and, yeah. and looking at it, reviewing it, uh, and pictorializing. Uh, so that was just one thing I think Jay uh, wanted to bring that up. Yes, uh, Jay, <laughs> when you were growing up, was there any one character in your neighborhood that you can say, oh, well, I remember, and we'd also have uh, nicknames, like, oh, I remember Joe the Bum, who used to be on the corner. I do, and I can still, a lot of them are still walking around today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> back, then, back then, it seemed as though neighborhoods had characters, right. and, you know? uh, and neighborhoods were, were characterized by, you know, individuals who we remember. Does your publication focus on, you know, the people like that. It does. Uh, they, not so much, so much the characters. Uh, there's a few we want to get in the book, but we haven't. But, you know, we focus on, you know, people that have some prominence. You know, Daddy Grace, uh, Judge Layton, you know, a lot of sports figures, yeah. uh, some a lot of lesser-known people that, you know, again, you know, sort of time forgot. Yes. Who are some, just uh, other than that, uh, any other uh, notables that uh, you talk about? And we're, we're chatting. With Jay Avila and Joe Thomas about the uh, picture history of New Bedford Volume Two. Well, that's the thing. If they're if time forgot them, they're not notable in, yeah. some, in a sense. Yeah. But some of them are like the we have a bronze medal winner. We only have one Olympic participant uh, who actually participated in a medal uh, in the 1924 Olympics. Yeah. And and uh, Al Solnier, our one of our writers, discovered him. Uh, his name was Larravee, and he won a bronze medal in track. And it's so far as far as we know, anyway. Yeah. Never, uh, it's never the only New Bedford that. person having to bring home a gold, uh, I mean a medal. Well, this is what Spinner does. I mean, you bring so much information to the forefront. It's so interesting. Oh, this yeah. is going to be made uh, available. It's going to be on the store shelves pretty soon, folks. So you want to get your order in. It's a picture history of New Bedford, volume 2, 1925 to 1980. And uh, it, I'm looking at a draft right now with striking pocketbook workers. 
from the Fairhaven Corporation on Consol Street, all the women holding signs. You know, that was a, a nice find. And the reason is we were, <coughs> we were doing a, a historical look at the garment industry. And the pocketbook the making was one of the early ones in the 20s, I think it was. Um, you know, we have a, a, a great uh, heritage here in, in apparel. That we know we do in the, the last, you know, 40, 50 years, but it goes back actually all the way before the Civil Sorry. War. New Bedford was uh, making ready to wear clothing for the whaling uh, ships. And, and earlier, I heard about uh, one size fits all started right here. Yeah, yeah ready made clothing, yes. So yeah. Started in Bedford. Yeah. This is incredible. And that's, you know, we got that information from books and from. People, scholars that have uh, written, this is well documented, uh, that ready to wear clothing mm -hmm. uh, was initiated in New Bedford. I Tell mean, us a little bit about Fisk Rubber Company, Goodyear Rubber Company, and Firestone Tire and Rubber Company. Well, the tire company, during World War I, uh, New Bedford uh, found a little niche uh, market in the course goods and the cotton, and which in that time, tires was a great market for them. The government had a lot of uh, contracts for manufacture of, uh, of uh, heavy cottons, uh, for parachutes, for tires, because tire, cloth was used in tires uh, for many years, even until recently. Uh, and so we sort of seized that in this uh, city, and, and in fact, uh, I think it started that, you know, the where the good year is now, that was... Um, a roach spinning mill, and that was owned by a big corporation, a conglomerate, if you want to call it that. Uh, and they were bought out by, I think, Passaic Mills, and with huge government contracts uh, to make uh, tires, to make a cloth for tires uh, during World War One. And finally, uh, after the war, they were they had to uh, they held they lost all their contracts. Well, well, the uh, the tire companies themselves came in to buy the mill. They bought the mill from the mill owners. I don't know if you want to tell you all this in detail, but that's how Goodyear, so and Goodyear and Fisk were two different companies. They both came in, bought the mill. They sort of partnered in, in the building. They split the building between the two companies, and then eventually it became Goodyear. I want you folks to, for a moment, use your mind's eye, because radio is the most visual of all mediums, Jay. And I want you to imagine New Bedford's Municipal Airport as a huge barn-like building with the uh, name New Bedford painted on its roof. And, there, and you had a weather vane on top, and there you go. There was Grand Central right there. This old barn, which actually was in Fairhaven. This was in Fairhaven, yes. Yes. right down the street from here, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this AT&T, where AT&T is. Uh, there's a fabulous photograph, and this is part of the magic of why you want to put your order in now for this publication. The other publication, uh, number one, has lots of uh, gorgeous pictures uh, as well. We're talking uh, with uh, Joe Thomas and Jay Avila about a picture history of New Bedford. This is volume two, and uh, folks, they do need our help to continue the preservation of history. What was uh, part of the fun of doing uh, this one? Well, again, it's, it's, for me, it's the photographs. And, you know, we find a lot of new stuff. And going back to that pocketbook uh, workers' strike, that's one of the photos that we, we got from somebody in the community. And we did a lot with social media, trying to get people to bring in their collections. And I think that adds a lot to this book, too, because it's stuff that's been sitting in people's closets for years. Sure. And it's really never been seen by anybody. And especially a lot of these uh, music photographs, we have a one. Uh, almost every chapter has every chapter does have this huge spread on music. Yeah, you know, uh, how many of you folks remember all of the marching bands that we <laughs> have? Any of them? <laughs> I mean, when you yeah. think about it, on a summer's night, you could hear the echo of the drums and the bugles from miles away. Of them uh, practicing in a park or in a school, right? Yeah. And uh, that was part of the memory of uh, our summers growing up. You uh, dedicate a nice portion to the marching bands. Uh, bands in general. I mean, we had, uh, Al Sonia, who uh, wrote the music section, 
actually, you wrote like a 32 page, uh, 30,000 yeah, word essay. 4,000 words, you turned it 50,000. <laughs> <laughs> then we had to cut it down and try to illustrate it, which was a job in itself. But uh, again, uh, you know, the community came through with a lot of photographs and also the Standard Times. I mean, if it weren't for the Standard Times, I mean, a lot of this, this book probably wouldn't even happen. Wow. Uh, I'm looking at a photograph, folks, of the Bailey Square Theater Orchestra of 1949, the year I was born. And what was the purpose of the Bailey Square Theater Orchestra? Well, vaudeville was still uh, big in the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, right? And uh, they were, a, they, you know, when the vaudeville acts came on, you, you had live music would, you know, play the introductory, you know, coming on stage, or they'd have little numbers they had to play. And, it, and even with the silent films, uh, they, they played live music. And it could have been an organist, it could have been a band. Sure. In this case, the Bailey Square, they, I think that's mostly the vaudeville acts. And, and, and sometimes they entertain in between shows. They would play some music. So a lot of the theaters had their orchestras. It was yes. sort of like built in. Yeah. I'm also looking at a photograph of a Baseball Hall of Famer, Walter Rabbit Maranville. 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 Uh, why is he in this? <laughs> well, he lived in New Bedford oh, after he, uh, and he's a Hall of Famer. But he, he's not born. He's born in New Hampshire, I think. But he lived in New Bedford, and he was a vaudeville. He went into vaudeville <laughs> after <laughs> being elected to the Hall. Yeah, and and uh, so we just stuck him in there because we had that great picture of him at one of the parks, yeah. pulling a rabbit out of the hat. You know, we've had a lot of uh, boxing legends from New Bedford, and I see you have early boxing yeah, we, legends here. Yeah, we have all different stages, yes. In fact, I interviewed Jimmy Carnes a few weeks ago, and he's a great interview. He's he a nice, uh, he's a treasure trove. He truly is. Yeah. We've had him on the air before. And he told us about uh, the very first job he had at St. Luke's Hospital. And uh, I, I need to go back and just replay that because it's such a classic. I'll just leave it as that. He's a good, good storyteller. He is a fabulous storyteller. And that's what you do here. You're, yeah. You not only present, you know, the, the facts and the figures, but, you know, just like uh, uh, in Dragnet, you also go beyond and you tell a story, you connect that. What is the golden thread that connects all of these stories? The gold, oh, geez, you know, Phil, that's a it's tough one, but the golden thread is New Bedford. I mean, it's just who who we are, trying to find out and and keep it going, you know, not to lose uh, our sense of, like, a cultural sense, a sense of that we we have an identity, and sometimes, uh, that's what you started talking, talking about before, and and we have a character, a characterization, is, you know, of who we are. We are a certain type of place, right. as is Fall River or... Boston, a time, you know, all, everybody has a character. We don't want to lose our character, and it, it, we need to keep it going presently, but we also need to think about where we've been and what we've been through. So I, I think, in fact, ethnicity has a lot to do with it. Who, you know, what our makeup is uh, racially, ethnically. Right. Be proud of it, enjoy it, relish it, whatever, celebrate it, but keep it going. Right now, in New Bedford, we, we have a lot of Hispanic uh, people. Let's celebrate that. Don't uh, always be demeaning everything. Try to find ways to celebrate who you are. Because 50 years from now, um, you know, I don't know, there may be Serbians and there may be, you know, sure. Lithuanians again and or, uh, sure. Brazilians and, yeah. and other groups here that we're not so familiar with. And then, uh, you know, we need to just keep it going. You know, uh Perhaps uh, George, who owns the uh, New Bedford, uh, the Whaling City Clippers, will be interested in uh, looking at the Defenders Football Club of New Bedford National Amateur Champs, 1925-1926. We have, a, a, obviously, a semi-pro uh, league now, the Whaling City Clippers, here in this day and age, and this goes back to 1925. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a connection with football and uh, in uh, in asking you to sum up because we're going to have you come back the uh, the wonders of this publication jay what would your summation be i mean it's just a, it's a great book and yeah. everybody's going to be this what's nice about this book is the time period people are going to be able to relate to this mm -hmm. probably have the first book it cut off in 1925 and i think people appreciated it yeah 
But for this, people want to be able to recognize their friends, their family, and you know, learn a lot of things that they just never knew. And uh, Joe? Yeah, I agree with that. That's uh, that's a nice thing. Is it's uh, it's still fresh. Uh, a lot of this is our parents, our grandparents, their lives. You know, we have a lot of interiors and stores. We have stuff on ice cream, gasoline stations. You know, sports and music are, are one thing, but there's also a lot in the workplace, and and stories on, like say immigration. Uh, so we we get to experience all of that uh, in a way that. Uh, it's just nice to look at. It's warm and fuzzy. So yes, it is. And not all of them. <laughs> no, we no, do cover no. the riots. And <laughs> yeah, we have the riot. We did yeah. a lot on urban renewal. We have yeah. a whole uh, chapter section on, on urban renewal and the riots in the 70s. We covered, we tried to cover events. Every chapter has, has a section on events, a section on people, a section on uh, infrastructure in the city, and a fourth section is... Uh, just People in general, the yeah. events, yeah. Yeah. well, well recreation. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to add um, this, folks. There was um, there was a, a group here called the New Bedford Liquor Squad. Oh yeah, yeah, that's the term prohibition. And uh, these were what members of the liquor squad or police officers yeah. who would destroy stills and you know all the places that they made liquor in and around this area. Yeah, yeah, that was their their function was to seek out, and destroy, uh, moonshine, oh you know, my gosh. Uh, contraband, and things that. Well, you know, this is prohibition, so yeah. Uh, we we tried to get we got at least uh, three or four nice uh, prohibition stories in the world. And stories. do you talk about the schooners picking up or dropping off uh, liquor in this area? A little bit, I, you know. This is the thing, uh, Phil. We can only. I know, you know have so much space. kind of a touching of yeah. everything. We can't we can't go into great detail on everything, but we do have the Black Duck uh, story, Charlie Travis. Oh yeah. Uh, then we have a, a shootout in uh, Dartmouth, the, the Bergeron uh, but, Farm. The Bergeron Farm. Uh, that was interesting, and then there's a couple of other shorter pieces on this is on a must, running. a must, a must have of the uh, new uh, publication coming out in November. Coming out in late November, right around Thanksgiving time. We don't have the date yet. We're, we're trying to wrap it up uh, right now. We've we'll got have a, lot, a lot of work to do. We'll have you on between now and then so that we can uh, promote the launch of a picture history of New Bedford Volume 2. Yeah, we'll have a nice book launch party that everyone will be invited to come and get a book and, and enjoy themselves. And can I just say one more time, uh, Phil, that uh, yes. why we need support from people is because... Uh, you know, this has been a three-year project, yes. and you know we're we're dealing with a small market relatively. We put a lot into this, and we, we want to publish a quality book in hardcover and softcover. Uh, you know, in, in with a small market like this, uh, you really have to find ways to raise money. Sure. You know, as a nonprofit organization ourselves, that's that's the only way we can get this done. Yes, through through, through public support. This book is going to contain about three hundred and sixty. Pages over twelve hundred rare and beautiful photographs. Uh, some uh, that you have never seen. Probably most that you have never seen, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you always bring a, a trivia question along and a gift. Did you do that this time, Jay? <laughs> well, that's Joe's uh, job. Well, the gift is the, the card we just left you. Uh, Where to send your money? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Trivia. Next next time we'll have. Uh, next, time, next time then. All right. We'll have our calendars out. Oh yeah, calendar. that's right. When are the calendars coming? Well, they'll be out next month. So. Okay. All right. Those are always uh, perennial favorites. All right. Thank you both. Anything you want to add? Finally. No, I think we're good, Phil. Thank we enjoy it. Thanks for always really supporting us. Oh. You've done so much for Spinner over the years. Thank you really have. You've been you. a great ambassador for us. Uh, Joe and Jay, thank you. I mean, words don't even begin to describe the, the, the appreciation our community has for Spinner for the importance of what you do in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.